So this is a very salient topic, right? Talking about uh, cardiovascular risk and the patients coming to you for their sexual health. So uh, I'm gonna go over not only that connection, a little bit of insight on medical management. How many people by show of hands treat ED in their clinical practice? Okay, so most of you. So it's not just cancer that we're talking about uh, in the course of this meeting. Again, my disclosures. Objectives, go over the data linking the two conditions, ED and cardiovascular health. Look at the steps in evaluating the patient who comes to your office before you start them on PDE5 inhibitors and the opportunities for lifestyle modifications and some data on potential risks with the standard medications we often use. So audience response question. Regarding PDE5 inhibitors for management of ED, which of the following is true? A causal relationship has been established between PDE5s and melanoma. Sildenafil should be avoided in renal transplant patients. PDE5s have been shown to reduce recurrence rates of prostate cancer. Daily Tadalafil is not recommended for dialysis patients. Nitrate use is no longer contraindicated for men using PDE5s. Well, with only 16 responses, yeah, we're spread out. So this gives us an opportunity for uh, some education. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Which of the following classes of medication are not believed to adversely affect erectile function? Antiarrhythmics, tricyclics, thiazides, beta blockers, or calcium channel blockers? Awesome. Okay, this will be good. So ED is seen in the majority of men over the age of 40. It doesn't mean it's severe in everybody, but over half of the men between the ages of 40 and 70 have some degree of ED, and that was based on the Massachusetts Male Aging Study. But nearly 20% of all men have moderate to severe ED, and this compromises quality of life, not only for men, but for their partners as well, and it can lead to loss of compliance and adherence to treatment. ED may be the sentinel symptom in those patients with undiagnosed peripheral or coronary artery disease. So it's like the canary in the coal mine, right? So you go down, you know, if you're, you want to know something is uh, uh, amiss early, you know, you take the bird, right? Carbon monoxide kills the canary before it kills the miner. So Francisco Martorsi uh, in Italy looked at 300 consecutive angina patients coming to the ER with chest pain who had angiography confirming coronary artery disease. Nearly half had ED. So looking at those patients that had both heart disease and ED, Two-thirds of them had their ED symptoms prior to their chest pain with a mean interval of about three months or three years and change. So Ian Thompson looked at the PCPT data, right? So you had men that were 55 and over, almost 10,000 in the placebo group, and they were checking them every three months for their sexual function and cardiovascular disease for a prolonged period of time. Prevalent or subsequent incident ED after five years was significantly associated with subsequent cardiovascular events, and that was found to be on par with smoking, or a family history of myocardial infarction. So a colleague of mine, Brent Emmon, over at Duke, looked at the Olmstead County data. Uh, this was a great paper. And he looked at the association between ED and the long-term risk of developing heart disease. He looked at age as a modifier. And for a man below the age of 50, having ED was associated with a 50-fold increase in the incidence of heart disease. So here that is. Uh, this is represented graphically. And again, you have age here. Okay, but if you look at a guy, and you could certainly see a multiple choice question, if you had a guy coming in 48, 49 years old, right, with ED, his rate of heart disease compared to somebody without it, 50 fold higher. So Steve Kopecki, who's a cardiologist at Mayo, uh, saw him recently um, at the SMS meeting. Uh, his group did a prospective study of over 1,000 men in that same age range I mentioned to you before. Mean follow-up was over 11 years, and they had 261 new cases. ED was significantly associated with cardiovascular disease even after controlling for age and associated risk factors and their Framingham score. However, it didn't improve prediction of cardiovascular disease beyond traditional risk factors. But a lot of us in your urologic practice aren't looking at those traditional risk factors as well as some other physicians might be. So what do you do? Well, you take your standard history, of course, right? We talk about libido, that primal urge to pursue sexual activity, and, but sometimes if that's down, it could be a compensatory mechanism for loss of function. Guys don't want to start something they can't finish, so sometimes they withdraw, right? There's ejaculation disorders, orgasmic disorders, structural disorders in the setting of per, uh, Peroni's disease. SHIM questionnaire, we've talked a little bit about questionnaires in the course of this meeting, like when we were asking Matt about why don't you use an AUA symptom score? Well, time's the answer, because there's so many questionnaires out there. Some people will get these things filled out in their office at a urology clinic and then never read them. 
They'll get put in electronically and perhaps by nursing, and then they just fall by the wayside. We have published, though, that you can ask just a single question, and it's still a good screen. So certainly look at lifestyle and reversible causes. So a simple screen for potential cardiovascular disease, two questions. One, do you have any chest discomfort or shortness of breath with exertion? And if so, does it get better with rest? It's simple. You can do that. So what about medication-induced uh, ED, right? We're all pretty well familiar with the beta blocker effect. So a lot of blood pressure meds can cause that. However, ACE inhibitors, angioretensin uh, receptor uh, blockers, and calcium channel blockers have either a neutral or beneficial effect. There's also the possibility of the Hawthorne effect, where if a patient knows that this can cause ED, he thinks he has ED. Antiandrogens, antiarrhythmics can cause ED. Statins, however, are a little bit controversial, but most of the data suggests they may actually be beneficial for patients with ED. Next slide. All right, physical exam. So one of the things we talk about in addition to vitals is waist circumference, and this is important, right, because this is used in certain models to determine cardiovascular risk. Of course, you can look at the traditional items. I'll admit I don't have a stethoscope in my office. Uh, some people do. They'll still carry it around. Um, testicular exam, certainly if you're looking at for signs of endocrine issues, if you have atrophy. Uh, plaques, of course, if you're looking for anything related to curvature. And then signs suggesting vascular and neurologic disease. Lab testing is considered optional in the workup of a man with ED. Uh, however, a fasting glucose, we talked about this earlier, is a good test. Um, A1C plus or minus, I do that before any uh, surgical, elective surgical case in my practice. Lipid profiles are valuable if you're going to do risk scoring, and it's not that hard to do that, and I'll show you that in a second. CBC, CRP, again, reasonable to consider, but not uh, mandatory and by any means. Hormone uh, profiles are somewhat controversial. However, certain guidelines do advocate checking testosterone, especially if they fail oral medications for first-line therapy. Uh, I may check estradiol, especially if we have someone who's obese, and then I look at a, a pituitary panel as well. So specialized testing. Now, who here does penile duplex in practice? Nobody. All right, good. So I'm not going to offend anybody. So I don't really do that a whole lot because I don't feel it changes management, okay? It can, however, you know, provide some kind of cognitive or psychological effect uh, or benefit to the patient. No one really does nocturnal penile tumescence too much anymore. Uh, it had poor correlation with the SHIM score, and it's obviated by good history and physical. Psychological evaluation, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to involve certain uh, inventories and questionnaires, but you kind of get a sense of what's going on with the patient when they come to you for their se uh, sexual health. Neurophysiologic testing, again, doesn't assess autonomics, and it's time-consuming. Arteriography seems way overboard. Endopat, we published previously in Journal Urology, is the only FDA-approved non-invasive test for endothelial dysfunction, okay? And so uh, this was something that can be done quickly in the office. It generates a score, and depending on that result, you can decide if the patient warrants a subsequent next-level testing with a cardiologist. Um, it reimburses fairly well, and it's easy to do in your clinic. As I mentioned, uh, bottom line on this slide, you can see in uh, the bold, is that the penile duplex may provide information that the patient understand. Again, not changing management. However, I don't know if this really comes up on exams if you don't do a lot of ED for research, but peak systolic velocity above 30 is considered normal. Less than 25 suggests arterial insufficiency, and then you look at end diastolic volume. If it's above five, it suggests venous leak, but you can only diagnose it if they have normal arterial function. So that can be somewhat problematic. So remember, the male sexual response is pretty complex. I never tell any man who comes to my office that it's all in your head, but I'll tell every man who ever has had a problem with his erection that there's always a psychological component because they're always wondering, how's it gonna be for me this time, right? And sometimes when they should be enjoying sexual activity, they're kind of checking themselves out thinking, how am I doing, right? So you have the nerve component, the blood flow component, a hormone component, which we heard about earlier as well, but you need intact vascular endothelium, okay? So the nerves are stimulated, acetylcholine, and then release of nitric oxide, and then cyclic GMP, and then ultimately you get flow. Oxidative stress we talk a lot about, right? Patients, especially now, are coming in asking about antioxidants and natural therapies. So the reactive oxygen species that are generated by different diseases or medications lead to endothelial dysfunction and reduced release of nitric oxide. So endothelial dysfunction seems to be the common link to cardiovascular disease in patients with ED, and this can be improved. 
by weight loss and increased activity. And we've seen this in studies showing changes in markers of inflammation, like IL-6 and C-reactive protein. Drugs like statins, as I already mentioned, but also some of these others listed here, have been shown to improve endothelial dysfunction, and phosphodiesterase inhibitors may do so as well. So chicken or the egg, right? So heart disease can be a cause of ED, or it could be a product of the same underlying issue. Similarly, a lot of the medications these men are on may uh, be a detrimental to their sexual function. However, if you can effectively treat their sexual dysfunction, you can lessen their anxiety, possibly pre preventing worsening of their heart disease and improving upon their quality of life. Chest pain during intercourse, which represents only a small percentage of all uh, of chest pain encounters, can lead to avoidance of sexual activity and decreased quali quality of life, and this has been published. So the Princeton 3 panel right, said that all men presenting with ED should be assessed for their cardiovascular risk. So what does that mean for you? Does that mean that you have to do intensive screening in your office? No. And you know, does it mean you have to do a Framingham score? No, but you should assess these patients. If they're at low risk, again, risk factor management. If they're high risk, get them over to a cardiologist. And because there's so much overlap between what we do in internal medicine and you know, the endocrinologist and the cardiologist, it creates a nice work group to really identify men at risk and that would benefit from your services, okay? The intermediate risk group probably warrants evaluation with either exercise stress testing or some other means. Phosphodiesterase inhibitors do not reduce, their ex uh, do not reduce exercise tolerance or increase events in men with heart disease. So if a guy comes and he's not on any nitrates, right, if he's healthy enough to walk in and out of your office and you don't see any other contraindications, just the fact that he has a history of heart disease doesn't mean that he can't have medications for his sexual health. However, Avanafil, which I don't typically prescribe, is not recommended in those who have had an event within the past six months. Okay, so if you do use that drug, you should be aware. Now, uh, I filled out these numbers. I don't know how well they project because it's a little dim, okay? But there are multiple online risk calculators. If you have a smartphone and you carry it with you in your office, you can always just type in this website, clincalc.com. Literally, it'll take you 60 seconds to calculate this man's risk if you have these values, right? It's gender, male, age, and this one I put in 58. You know, total cholesterol, HDL, all right? And so you'll get asked questions about their hypertension, and their uh, systolic blood pressure, right? And if they're a smoker, you hit calculate. In this scenario, the 10-year cardiovascular risk for heart disease is over 30%, right? So that's important. So bottom line, if you're gonna prescribe a tablet, you should check their cardiovascular risk. If you treat ED upfront successfully with meds and the patient just comes back once a year for refills but doesn't address his lifestyle, have you hurt him? There's a lot of guys that come to me that don't even have a primary care doctor. And the only reason that they even went to see a provider is because they want better sexual function, okay? So sometimes by not looking deeper, I would compare it to treating a bleeding chest wound with a red sweater, right? So get you to the party, but you won't be partying long. So what about lifestyle modifications? We talk a lot about it. Matt talked about this earlier, but it's easier said than done, right? Somebody made a comment. How many, how many of your patients go to the gym, for example, to try to boost testosterone? How many of you in the audience have ever tried to lose weight or change your diet or say you're gonna to get to the gym and then not do it, right? Lots of us. So, however, there was a randomized single-blind trial looking at obese men with ED that found that detailed advice did result in a significant drop in BMI and changes in their inflammatory markers. Their mean IIEF score improved by about three points, which was statistically significant, but again, keep that in perspective. And a multivariate analysis, changes in BMI activity and C-reactive protein were independently associated with improvement in erectile function. A meta-analysis of six clinical trials, again, saw significant improvements in their IIEF score with lifestyle modification. And again, 2.4 to 2.6, which is pretty much less than one tablet of Viagra, okay? It's positive, but it's not a home run. Remember the whole comment I made before in terms of BPH symptoms, base hit versus home run in terms of impact. So, you know, when Viagra came out, again, game changed, okay? It was originally investigated to treat angina and marginal benefit and had the peculiar side effect of improved erections. And then hit the scene in 90, uh, 98, and then you had uh, subsequent drugs follow. Some of these drugs you see at the bottom aren't approved in the United States, but are av available in places like Korea. So 
This class of medication is used for a variety of conditions, right? That's why you can get generic sildenafil. Now, Revatio would be listed as, right? Pulmonary hypertension. But that's why it only comes in the 20 milligram tablets as well. So all of these drugs typically, except Cialis, should be taken on an empty stomach. And I've listed the time to maximum concentration, even though they don't necessarily have to wait that full amount of time to reap benefit. The half-life and efficacy is listed here. Many of us are aware of this. Cialis, you should know, though, has the highest selectivity for uh, type 5 phosphodiesterase. So which one's best, right? I would kind of encourage you not to just give someone prescriptions for all of these or a bag of samples and say, try them all and see what works best, right? So that can be frustrating for men and sometimes it can be, have negative consequences. So a meta-analysis of 118 trials, okay, uh, had four principal findings. These drugs work better than nothing. Well, that's not surprising. But Cialis seems to be the most effective. Adverse events are mild and well-tolerated, and there's no significant difference in safety prof profile among these different drugs. I tend to use Cialis more, but again, with cost concerns, a lot of us probably default to generic Viagra for many of these patients. So these drugs are structural analogs to cyclic GMP, and they bind to the catalytic site and inhibit uh, hydrolysis. Cyclic GMP levels go up, raise penile blood, flow, penile blood flow, and amplify the neurologic signal. So they're largely considered safe, They've been used in infants for other conditions, right? They are safe and effective in transplant patients, and side effects are fairly common, probably more common than what the uh, drug insert says, right? Because uh, for those of us in practice, and many of you said you treat ED, headache, uh, sinus congestion, these types of things, even in patients that are happy to keep using them, will note that these happen. But I find that, you know, if you give a man a quality erection and he hasn't had one in a while, he'll overlook the headache or take a couple Tylenol beforehand. So the side effects are based on the effects with other uh, isoenzymes of phosphodiesterase, type 1, type 6, type 11, and you can see the side effects uh, that we often discuss with patients listed there. So what about renal patients? You saw me ask a question about this before. ED is seen in the overwhelming majority of dialysis patients and affects their quality of life, and it's seen in half of our transplant patients. Viagra will absorb faster after dialysis, and, they're ma and the max concentration in the half-life is increased by Prograf, which essentially all your kidney transplant patients are taking. Sildenafil is well tolerated in these patients. However, if the creatinine clearance is below 30, you should start at 25 milligrams, okay? Looking at Cialis, if the creatinine clearance is 31 to 50, you start at five milligrams and a max dose of 10 milligrams, not the 20. I find a lot of providers have never heard this data before, okay? If it's less than 30, if they're on dialysis, do not exceed five milligrams in 72 hours. Thus, daily dosing is not recommended. Again, some of you are starting to think, oh geez, I probably got some of these patients. I never knew this before. So what about chronic use and the heart? Meta-analysis, 24 trials, looking at efficacy and safety, uh, cardiac morphology and function was reported. The authors concluded that these drugs have an anti-remodeling effect and they improve cardiac contractility with a good safety profile. And the ideal target population was felt to be those patients that had heart failure and left ventricular hypertrophy. It's also been shown to be safe when given before bypass. Some people for a while there were saying we should put this in the water, right? So looking at diabetes, again, seems to have a positive impact, uh, improves hemodynamic and serum pro-inflammatory markers in these men. Nitrates are still contraindicated and implicated in some deaths. So one group demonstrated that ren uh, renolazine could be used as a nitrate alternative, something to, for the patients to talk about with their cardiologists. Remember, if they're also on an alpha blocker, you want to separate the dose if it's a non-selective uh, alpha blocker. If it's not, it's not really an issue. Uh, be aware if they're using any adulterated supplements over the counter. What about melanoma? There was a study suggesting it induced melanoma invasion or uh, with a uh, hazard ratio of 1.8. And the rationale of meds acting similar to a proto-oncogene uh, was reported, and increasing invasiveness by lowering uh, expression of PDE5 type A, okay? So there was a follow-up study to this, Swedish study, and they looked at their melanoma registry, also showing an increased association, all right? But it's not necessarily cause and effect, and it may be related to socioeconomic status and more exposure to sunlight, but we still don't know. So there might be a selection bias. I don't want to spend too much time on this uh, based on our time constraints, uh, but in terms of NION, which is a form of optic neuropathy, uh, the FDA has mandated a warning for this, and uh, subsequent studies that were commissioned by, uh, 
to be performed by Pfizer did show that the odds ratio is real, even though the absolute risk is still small. So if the patient has a history of this, uh, you want to exercise some caution. Cancer controversies, there was a German study suggesting it may increase biochemical re uh, recurrence, which was actually opposite the hypothesis that they, uh, that they developed. The follow-up Italian study didn't find uh, the same thing, and, but both were retrospective and the jury's still out. All right, let's go back to our questions before we close. Regarding the PD-5 inhibitors for management of ED, which one is true? Causes melanoma, should be avoided in transplant. It's been shown to reduce prostate cancer recurrence. Daily Tadalafil is not recommended for dialysis patients, or nitrates are no longer contraindicated. Perfect. Almost perfect. Next one. Which of the following classes are not believed to adversely affect erectile function? Antiarrhythmics, tricyclics, thiazides, beta blockers, or calcium channel blockers? Well, it's better. Still not perfect, but yes, calcium channel blockers is the correct answer. So in conclusion, consistent with the Princeton 3 uh, consensus, all men should be asked about their sexual function, regardless of their chief complaint. And if they have ED, determine their risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Oral therapies appear to be safe. And although there's no conclusive data uh, linking uh, PD-5s as causing uh, melanoma, sunscreen is still a good thing.